everyone, I'm Evan Benoit. I'm a student at the University of Utah. Uh, and today I'm going to present my research on a broad spectrum SSTDR VNA for energized circuits. So why do we want to measure impedance? Well, we use impedance measurements to electrically characterize circuits and circuit components and conduct medical imaging as well as test functionality and sensors to validate matching networks for antennas. Two, two of the most common devices Sorry, I'm having some screen issues here. Two of the most common devices used for measuring um, impedance is a vector network analyzer and the impedance meter, or LCR meter. Uh, the VNA is the most widely used and considered the gold standard. VNAs measure the impedance by sending a desired number of test frequency signals into a device under test and measure the ratio of reflection and transmission from and through the device. LCR meters use a combination of series and parallel circuitry measurements to determine the impedance of the device under test. Impedance measurements are conducted regularly. However, challenges arise when attempting to conduct measurements under certain, circuit, certain circumstances, such as electrically noisy environments, um, needing to remove the device from service due to being energized or to connect to the VNA or LCR meter, and matching equipment capabilities to the specifications of the device under test, systems that cannot be de-energized, and conducting multiple measurements over a very short period of time. So VNAs conduct their measurement by measuring the ratio of reflection and transmission of an incident signal from and through a device under test. For a set desired for a set of desired frequencies, the results are captured in a scattering parameter matrix, which is a complex valued matrix. The complex values contain information regarding the electrical characteristics of the device under test at the specific frequencies of the incident signals. The S11, in particular, is the measure of the reflected signal from the input plane of the device under test. Using the scattering parameter matrix for a one-port device, we can see that the ratio of reflected versus incident signal is calculated by dividing the reflected signal by the incident signal. This particular measurement captures the relationship between the transmission line impedance and the impedance of the load, and represents the transmission line impedance and the impedance of sorry, uh, and represents the impedance discontinuity at the input plane of the device under test. A similar measurement method to a one-port VNA can be conducted with, a, with reflectometry. Time domain reflectometry is widely used to locate impedance discontinuities along a transmission line system and is excellent at identifying open and short circuit conditions. The time delay between the incident signal and the reflected signal give indication to the impedance discontinuity's location, while the magnitude of the reflected signal compared to the incident signal indicate the severity of an impedance discontinuity. And this is all represented by the reflection coefficient. So the reflection coefficient is more specifically defined as a measure of the impedance discontinuity between the transmission line impedance Z0 and the load impedance ZL at a point along the transmission line. This allows us to make the direct relation between the reflection coefficient and an S11 measurement from a VNA. While both measurements methods provide information regarding impedance discontinuity on a transmission line, they are both also plagued by similar limitations. Neither method can be used on energized systems without including additional hardware to protect the measurement device. Both methods experience difficulty maintaining high degrees of accuracy in electrically noisy environments, as well as the presence of data or control signals. However, sequence time domain reflectometry, STDR, and spread spectrum time domain reflectometry, SSTDR, can both operate on energized electrical systems up to one kilovolt. They are inherently immune to electrically noisy environments, and they do not require the absence of data or control systems in the signal. So what makes the STDR and SSTDR measurements so special? The STDR and SSTDR measurements gain their benefits through their incident signal construction, the correlation between their incident and reflected signals, and their ability to be analyzed in either time or frequency domains. 
The STDR signal is constructed using a linear feedback shift register consisting of N flip-flops or bits to produce a pseudo noise code. The SSTDR signal is constructed by modulating the pseudo noise code with the square wave. Both incident signals are then launched onto the transmission line through transmission and receiving circuitry at the front end of the measurement device. The correlation occurs in the measurement device by using a copy of the incident signal and the reflected signal to produce the correlated time domain output response. Similar to the time domain reflectometry, the STDR and SSTDR measurements can be analyzed in the time domain by using the time delay between the incident and reflected signals to indicate the distance to the fault, as well as the magnitude and shape of the reflected signal to indicate the severity of the impedance discontinuity. By use of the Fourier transform, we can convert the time domain response into the frequency domain and analyze the frequency dependence of, an, of the impedance discontinuity through the extracted reflection coefficient. We can further anify, analyze reflections in the transmission line system by using the reflection coefficient equation and solving for load impedance, ZL. We then substitute the extracted reflection coefficient into the load impedance equation along with the known transmission line impedance, Z0, to extract the load impedance that caused the reflection of the incident signal. This is shown in equation 1. In this plot, the black dotted line represents the magnitude and phase of the simulated load, ZL sim, which was constructed using a 75 ohm resistor and a 100 picofarad capacitor. The solid blue line, SSTDR, and the dotted orange line, STDR, are the result of the impedance extraction using equation 1 and substituting the extracted reflection coefficient determined by the ratio of incident and reflected signals. As a measure of accuracy between the simulated load ZL sim and the extracted load ZL EXT, we calculated the error in extraction using the equation that's written in purple. The results of the error calculation as a function of frequency are then shown by the plot outlined in orange. Here, the y-axis is limited to a maximum error of 10%, and the x-axis is the frequency spectrum of the STDR and SSTDR signals. This deserves a quick note for explanation. The frequency spectrum of the STDR signal contains the DC component and ends at the frequency FSTDR. For simplicity of explanation and plotting purposes, we set FSTDR equal to FM for this presentation, where FM is the modulation frequency of the SSTDR signal. The SSTDR spectrum is shifted off the DC component by modulating the PN code with the square wave of frequency FM. Therefore, the SSTDR frequency spectrum ranges from greater than DC to two times the modulation frequency. It's also important to note the areas of expected high error, the first of which occurs with low signal energy near the ending bound of the frequency spectrum for both STDR and SSTDR. The second occurs in an area of high impedance magnitude near DC. In this region, the SSTDR, and in this region, the SSTDR has further complications with accurately extracting the load impedance due to also having low signal energy. Therefore, the STDR is the better choice for extracting impedance near DC. And this is shown in point A of the outline in orange. In the next portion of this presentation, I'll cover a few STDR and SSTDR device construction variables that play a large role in impedance extraction accuracy. The three device variables I'll focus on, PN code length, modulation frequency, and transmission and receiving sample rate. The PN code length is directly determined by the number of flip-flops in the linear feedback shift register and follows the convention of 2 to the n bits minus 1. This first error plot was constructed using previously discussed 75 ohm resistor and 100 picofarad capacitor for ZL SIM. However, ZL EXT was extracted using a PN code length of 31 bits. Notice in this error plot how there are very few areas across the frequency spectrum where the error is less than 5% for both STDR and SSTDR. 
I then repeated the simulation with 15 flip-flops in the linear feedback shift register to greatly increase the PN code length. Here you can see that the extracted magnitude and phase error is drastically reduced across the STDR and SSTDR spectrums, with majority of the frequency spectrum less than 5% error. Next I will discuss the trade-offs of changing the modulation frequency FM. Note that FSTDR is still set equal to FM for simplicity and plot plotting purposes. We start with the modulation frequency equal to 24 megahertz. This results in a frequency spectrum for STDR range from DC to 24 megahertz and SSTDR to range from greater than DC to 48 megahertz. We then drop the modulation frequency to 12 megahertz and repeat the impedance extraction and error calculation, followed by 6 megahertz modulation frequency. To more clearly show the results of changing the modulation frequency, I zoom in on the error plots outlined in red. You can see by or you can see that by decreasing the modulation frequency and therefore as FSTDR as well, we are able to more accurately extract the load impedance at lower frequencies using either STDR or SSTDR. This is very useful when a measurement is required to be taken at a specific frequency, whether it be in the kilohertz range or even higher in the megahertz range and leaves us with the ability to tailor our measurement accuracy at specific frequencies of concern. Lastly, I'll cover the effects of increasing transmission line, transmission and receiving rate beyond the minimum Nyquist value. The Nyquist value is the minimum sampling rate to prevent aliasing and states that the minimum sampling rate must equal two times the maximum frequency in the signal, F max. For STDR, F max equals F STDR, and for SSTDR, F max equals two times FM. Notice how increasing the sample rate to four times the minimum Nyquist value actually decreases the accuracy of the extracted impedance. This is due to introducing additional frequencies to the incident and reflected signals through sampling and spreads out the energy in the signal to new higher frequencies. This, however, only inhibits the accuracy of the frequency domain analysis as the time domain of the STDR and SSTDR signal gains a large improvement based on more time domain sample points, which greatly smooths out the time domain response. Higher sampling rate in the time domain analysis allows for great location accuracy, which is based on the peak of the correlated signal. In conclusion, both the STDR and SSTDR measurements can be performed on live electrical systems up to one kilovolt and in the presence of data or control signals without interference. This eliminates the need to remove the device under, remove the device under test from the system or from service. We can maintain high accuracy of extracted impedance by using a long, long P encodes as the base of our incident test signals. Additionally, we can decrease the length of the PN code to reduce computation efforts in the measure, if the measurement does not require high precision. We can tailor the measurement to provide highly accurate results at frequencies of concern simply by adjusting the modulation frequency. We can also use the modulation frequency to sweep very wide band of frequencies to build a more encompassing frequency response of a load. And lastly, we know that increasing our sampling rate does not provide additional frequency domain analysis benefits, but it does for the time domain analysis. Some of our future work is focused on conducting multiple measurements simultaneously by using multiple distinct P encodes. The inherent noise immunity through correlation is an added benefit when launching multiple P encodes simultaneously, as they will not interfere with each other. We would also like to extend the use of STDR and SSTDR for impedance extraction beyond a one port device and will be able to fully characterize a device under test with a similar scattering parameter matrix to that of a VNA. Thank you for your time. And for a full list of our publications, you can go to the address on the website listed.
Uh, yeah, the, well, the close, we, closer we get to DC, um, we, we start running into limits because the magnitude of the uh, impedance um, gives us basically an open circuit measurement, and we can't determine between a really high open circuit or really high resistance. As far as the high end of the frequency goes, um, we've been looking around the 96 megahertz um, for the highest. I, I don't see why it wouldn't be able to go higher. For using an S, uh, a VNA, yes. For, for our system, no, we don't have to de-energize the system or disconnect it. It's due to the signal, um, because the, the, the first part of building the signal is a pseudo noise code. So it really just blends into the background of the noise in the, in the system that already operates. It's already operating.